So welcome everyone to today's virtual talk in focus, protecting the nitrate film heritage hosted by the George Eastman Museum in Rochester, New York. In Focus is our monthly sig signature lecture series, which gives you a more in-depth look into what is happening at the museum. My name is Margaret Shebley, and I'm the manager of digital learning and engagement here at the Eastman Museum. And we have begun recording our video. And as I said, the live transcript is turned on to anyone who needs closed captions today. I'm here with my colleagues, Peter Bagrove, our senior curator, and Deborah Stoiber, the collection manager, both of the Moving Image Department. And talk like these are in thanks to our museum members and a generous donations the George Eastman Museum receives. And to learn more about becoming a member and seeing the remarkable and vast collection of materials the museum has, please visit www.eastman.org. Now we invite anyone to ask questions at any point during the discussion today, which will then be read at the end of the presentation. So if you have a question at the bottom of your screen, you should see the icon that says Q&A. And you can submit your questions there. And at the end of the conversation, we will try to answer as many as we can. And we look forward to having an engaging conversation. Now, including the Q&A, the presentation will last about an hour today. And again, we are recording today's talk. So if you want to watch this again or later share with friends and colleagues, that would be greatly appreciated. And the recording will appear on the Eastman Museum YouTube page within a week or so. Now, I would like to turn it over to Peter and Deb to tell us all about the exciting world of nitrate. We will be talking about uh, the nitrate film collection at the George Eastman Museum, uh, its strength, its challenges its future. And uh, we would like to start by thanking uh, those who help us uh, support and uh, um, enhance the nitrate film protection. So um, we, our nitrate walls are currently uh, being upgraded, renovated and uh, expanded, which is a huge and a very ambitious project, which is not only time consuming, but also pretty expensive. So we'd like to mention at least some of the organizations and friends who are helping us with this, starting with the um, National Endowment for the Humanities, the NAH. They've been helping the museum and the moving image department in many projects, and they're one of the key funders of this current project. Um, minute. Uh, then NISCA, the New York State Council of the Arts, is also a major uh, funder of uh, the current upgrade of the Nightwood Vault. Uh, the Packard Humanities Institute, they actually do not have a logo, but I really wanted to share this uh, image of their beautiful uh, building in, uh, in Santa Clarita, uh, California. Um, one of the biggest uh, donors of the Moving Image Department for uh, more than two decades, and they've been crucial in this project as well. And the Louis B. Mayer Foundation, this is not their logo, but this is one of the most amusing pictures of, the Louis, of Louis B. Mayer, the great uh, film producer that we found. So uh, we have this instead of their logo. And there are many other uh, individuals, and I would like to single out uh, one maybe as a, a very generous donation from Digby Clements, who is a trustee of the George Eastman Museum, and he is the chair of the Moving Image Collection. Uh, uh, collections committee of our board of trustees. So uh, with this, I would like to hand over the microphone, so to say, to my colleague, Deb Stoiber. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Deborah Stoiber. I'm the collection manager in the movie and image department. I've been here almost 25 years working uh, specifically with the motion picture collections. Um, most of it, almost all that time has been handling the nitrate collection as sort of my main focus. But before I got here, uh, we've had this collection for quite a lot of time since the beginning of the museum. And so how did we get started with nitrate? Well, it all started with our first curator, James Card, pictured here in the, I love that red car, by the way, uh, in front of our Dryden Theater at the museum. But also there's a picture of him in our first vaults. And these were our strong vaults, which were uh, designed to hold our nitrate motion picture film collections. 
James Card originally started the moving image department in the museum with 800 reels of his personal film collection. He uh, was um, working here in the Rochester area and was hired to help start up at the, when the beginning of the museum to create a motion picture uh, film department that would uh, look at the entire uh, array of nitrate films and how to preserve them, conserve them, and make them considered to be museum pieces. So as we already know, we are in the George Eastman house. It doesn't really design to have vault space for flammable films. So if Peter wants to go to the next slide, you'll see some images. Um, here's more of uh, James Card. And standing outside of our Henry A. Strong vaults. And these are still located on the property of the museum at 900 East Avenue in the back of the property. And they were built in 1952 as the first nitrate vaults that were built by a private institution that were fireproof and air conditioned. And quite often people ask us, well, who was Henry A. Strong? And I have lots of different, different uh, ideas. So Henry A. Strong was a Kodak president and his stepson, Corin Strong, was actually the US ambassador for Norway. And he wanted to uh, have something that would live for his stepfather's legacy for what he was able to do for film, what he was able to do for George Eastman as becoming the president of Kodak at that time period. So uh, Corin Strong donated $100,000 to the museum to build six vaults on the property, as you can see in this photo of James Card. Uh, that would be using to house not only the motion picture collections for the George Eastman House, but also would hold a lot of the material for the Museum of Modern Art. So again, we were the first uh, place to private institution in the United States to build our own uh, nitrate vaults. So we actually held films for other institutions. Um, the dollars did go immediately outside, as you see in this picture, and there used to be some beautiful trees located behind the property as well. Uh, if you are ever at the museum, you can still see these. They're not open. You can't really go inside, but you can kind of see the original design for nitrate vaults here. And we'll go ahead and change the slide over. So what did we store in these? And this is, I think, some of Peter and I are favorite slides that we're going to be talking about. So we might go back and forth a lot and just kind of talk about what it is we hold in the collections. And I, I really like this slide because it shows everything we hold. So for those of you who don't know, nitrate film um, basically started around 1895 is usually the date given for, for starting. It started a little bit earlier, but really becoming commercially available was 1895. And you see this scene of um, a Paris street. And you can see there's rubble on the street. This is a Lumiere film that was taken in 1895 of, of just a city street in the area. And I like comparing that to one of the last films that was made on nitrate film stock, which is the American film, An American in Paris. And you can see it's very stylized. It's very much made um, this particular scene on a studio lot. But also this one is in Technicolor. We do have a lot of original Technicolor negatives in our, in our vaults at the George Eastman Museum, including American in Paris, Gone with the Wind, Wizard of Oz, Meet Me in St. Louis. Um, so I wanted to show you this sort of beginning of nitrate and end of nitrate and different ideas of, of kind of what we store in our collection here. Peter, do you have anything to add on these two pictures? On this two? Um, no, I think, I think this is good. If we move to the next slide. Okay. Um, this is yours, Peter. <laughs> okay, I'll talk about this one. <laughs> you talk about this one. So um, we are now, the Eastman Museum is not the first film archive in the United States. We're the second one. The first one was um, the film department back then at the M Museum of Modern Art, which was founded in 1935 uh, by a great archivist, a pioneer archivist, Iris Berry. And uh, um, thanks to MoMA, a lot of great films were saved not only American films but world films but the idea that Iris Berry had and MoMA in general was that their film collection is in a way a parallel to their collection of fine art of paintings and sculpture so if you have a work of cinema it should be something on the level of uh, Matisse or Picasso or... and uh, uh, so it happened maybe partially because Iris Berry was British that it was very much uh, Europe centered so MoMA collected great uh, German films and French films, and was very picky uh, where American films were concerned. So Chaplin was serious, 
Once Jorheim was serious, Griffith was serious, Buster Keaton was serious, Cecil B. DeMille, not really. I never checked, so that may be just an anecdote, but according to James Card, who of course was, there was this rivalry between him and MoMA, in a way, even though they were sort of friends and enemies at the same time, he was saying that they only accepted one film by Cecil B. DeMille, which is male and female. Um, that might be slightly exaggerated, but it is true that MoMA was very much centered on the arty side, let's say, of uh, the movies. So James Card thought that uh, world film history does not consist only of the great masterpieces that change the film language, that blockbusters that change the audience's perception of cinema are as important, and even some obscure films. So this was his idea uh, to collect cinema in all its entirety. With the great masterpieces such like such as works of Van Stroheim or, uh, I don't know, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, which was one of the very first prints he obtained, and then, uh, um, or uh, Lubitsch's German films, but also uh, some of the most important American films. So one of the collections he was very eagerly pursuing was the personal collection of Cecil B. DeMille, because like some of the major filmmakers, like very few of them, unfortunately, but still, um, he, Cecil B. DeMille, collected his films and had an almost complete collection, starting from the early days and until the very end of he actually went on to make films in the safety era. And James Card contacted Cecil B. DeMille and met with him, but DeMille was reluctant to donate the films. So James Card waited and waited and waited until Cecil B. DeMille died, and then he contacted his daughter, and uh, uh, the Eastman House, back then, George Eastman House, now George Eastman Museum, obtained uh, the complete collection of Cecil B. DeMille's personal prints. And because they're his personal prints, they're known to be the most complete, the most final version, because very often, especially silent films, uh, exist as being truncated, censored, and so forth. And we have been preserving them and re-preserving them using different technologies for decades since then. On the left is an image of uh, the cheat, uh, one of DeMille's greatest masterpieces, one of his first masterpieces, starring the great uh, Japanese-American actress Sasu Hayakawa on the left. Um, and The Phantom of the Opera, another great film which uh, was uh, saved and restored thanks to the George Eastman Museum. We do not have the only element for uh, this uh, horror classic starring Lon Chaney and his very famous makeup. He was known as the Man of a Thousand Faces. Um, but we were known to, and still are known, to have the definite print of the film, which is somewhat incomplete, but because we had the most complete print of all of the existing ones, uh, the museum uh, conducted a very complicated restoration project of this uh, great silent classic. So this is sort of the James Carr take on the classics. He wanted to expand the definition of what should be considered a classic film. Mm -hmm. Shall we move to the next slide then? Yeah. Yeah, I just was thinking the Phantom of the Opera, the restoration was the first film I ever saw in our Dryden Theater. That was that was talk about an introduction to uh, the George Eastman Museum collection. It was the very first, I still remember it. So as Peter was saying, uh, we do have a, a lot of material in our collections. And I like I like doing this slide because it shows just the wide range we do collect here. So we we do are known for having a lot of the Greta Garbo silence, the, the Gilbert and Garbo materials. Here's Flesh and the Devil from 1926. Um, we have the original camera negatives for this in our collection as well, and just, you could see just some of the stars from that time period, I mean, just, they still look beautiful on this nitrate material, it's still in wonderful shape, and it, it really is a highlight and a privilege to work on these films, and to house these um, at the George Eastman Museum is, is really spectacular for us to do. Uh, but what I like to also point out is the one on the right. And this, Peter, when I presented this up, Peter was like, what is this? Uh, so this is a kind of a quirky little film we have in the collection. So we, we you know, we we do accept films for being art for art's sake, you know, like Peter was saying, like MoMA. But we also collect a wide variety of just mishmash and weird and kind of crazy and nostalgic. And what is this really? So I always like talking about this one. It's called The Sign of the Cucumber from 1917. And it is a low grade barely a budget film. And it's a Western that we preserved several years ago. And it's basically the story of a man um, who is a sheriff in a small town and he's a really nice guy. And he gets a telegram saying that, you know, the bad guy's coming into town and he's gonna tear up the town. He escaped from prison. He's gonna take your girl and shoot your dog and, and, and run the town crazy. But the problem is he looks exactly like the sheriff. They could be twins. 
And the sheriff says, oh, no, 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 no. There's a way to tell us apart. I have a mark on my arm that looks like a cucumber. And so the whole movie is them running around trying to capture the bad guy, but they keep capturing the sheriff and all he has to do is show his, you know, his cucumber mark. And it's, it's kind of an early spoof of Western. It really is a spoof on Westerns. It's a spoof on uh, just early cinema at the time. It's a lot of fun. It's a short little film that we have in the collection, but you know, it's yes, it's stored in the same vaults next to some, some really spectacular titles. But what I always like to say is, um, you know, there's so many interesting and different things that were filmed in that time period. And, you know, to try to conserve as many of them as possible to make them available to modern audiences is, is really important to do so that people get a wide range of the humor of the time and the, and the topics of the time and, and what was what were people discussing and what were people debating and what, were, what, were, what was humorous and what was not. So I, I, I kind of like to point this one out in the collection. It's, it's, one, of my, it's one of my all-time favorites. Let's move to the next one. So this one um, is also two films that we have in our collection that are both unique uh, to the George Eastman Museum. We have the most, the best surviving material for both of them. One of them is, of course, Paul Robeson in uh, Body and Soul, um, which we have done full preservation with the tinting records at the George Eastman Museum. And it's one of our more popular films that we do loan out on a regular basis from our safety materials. So we do have full preservation that we have made through uh, different fundraising uh, backs and uh, been able to make this not only, to make this available on 35 millimeter film. And um, this is a very interesting story. It is uh, one of the uh, most compelling stories that we do have from, I, I believe my opinion from the silent era. And then on the right, um, this is one that not a lot of people know about outside of Idaho, but this is Nell Shipman in uh, her film, Whitewater. She was an actress, a producer, a director. She had her own independent uh, film company. And she made, she's mostly known for making a film called The Girl from God's Country, which is currently out on DVD. But this is another film she made called Whitewater around the same time period. She worked with a lot of animals. She always had a bear in her films. It was her own, her own bear that she had trained. A lot of uh, children. There were wholesome stories about living in Idaho and living with nature and getting, getting out and doing the right thing. So her films were, she was never a Hollywood actress. She was never somebody to go and do the glamour shots of Greta Garbo, but she made a very important collection of films. And there's some wonderful books written about her work and a lot of preservation you can still see in films out there. Some of her films are missing and lost. Whitewater was actually found by the George Eastman Museum over 10 years ago. It was found in an abandoned movie theater in San Francisco. All it was missing was the title card. It had been marked as unidentified Western. And with some research uh, with the staff at the museum, we were not only able to identify it, but able to find funding to do full preservation on this title. I would like to add one thing. Yeah. So unlike some of the countries with a great cinematic uh, history and, and heritage like uh, Sweden or Denmark or China, which is a huge country, but they have only one film archive, at least one major film archive, member of the FIAF, the International Federation of Film Archives. There are multiple major archives in the United States. We're one of the oldest, the second oldest one, but you know, where there is MoMA and MoMA's mission has still has since then expanded really. You know, it's not just uh, a chaplain and, and Griffith. It's, it's really huge. The Library of Congress, UCLA, uh, the Academy Film Archive, uh, several wonderful university archives in Yale and Harvard and so forth, which means that uh, every single arc, each single archive doesn't have to be responsible for all of American film heritage. And we can afford to spend time, not just on the canonical films. We can afford to spend time on the obscure and forgotten titles and to make them better known. So, I mean, Body and Soul, there's a couple more words about this film. Uh, Paul Robson, of course, was a legendary performer, uh, performer um, and, well, social activist and singer and actor uh, from the beginning of his career, and sportsman too, by the way. But uh, his name was well known. But the name of the director of this film, Oscar Michaud, was not known for uh, decades. And Oscar Michaud was arguably the first uh, active and prolific uh, Black film director in the world. Um, because there were films with Black actors made by white directors fairly frequently, but uh, very rarely films made by Black directors. Um, now there are books about him, and uh, there is an exhibition in the Academy Film Museum, which is sort of dedicated in part to him right now. Mm -hmm. But back at the time when we were preserving this film, the name was fairly unknown. 
But the idea, which again started with James Card's philosophy of film archives, and that was taken by his successors, by um, uh, Chris Horak and Paolo Kerkuzai and Pat Locke and many others, uh, is that we really should be looking at everything. And uh, we're very happy that some of the films which were completely obscure are now canonical. Whitewater is still not too well known, but Body and Soul is now considered a classic. And yeah. we're proud of that thanks to our efforts. Mm -hmm. Partially thanks to our efforts and film scholars too. Yeah. Let's move to the next one. Um, well, let me say a couple words, words about these ones. So uh, even though James Card was particularly concerned with uh, um, <clears throat> the future of American classic films that might have been destroyed, and he was actually going to film studios and persuading them to um, either deposit or donate their film prints and negatives. And very often the studios were not interested in old films because they were not box, off, box office hits anymore, with very few exceptions, like in A Gone with the Wind. Um, uh, but um, or, or he would borrow the negatives and make prints, and the negatives were then destroyed, sometimes by accident, sometimes even on purpose. Uh, and now the prints we have are the best prints of those films. But uh, he was, of course, also interested in world cinema. And we have quite a lot of treasures of world cinema here, just, just two of them. The image from the, on the left is from Olympia, which is uh, a great masterpiece of cinema, but uh, in some ways a controversial film because it was uh, a, an important part of the uh, Nazi propaganda in, in, uh, in Germany. It was, it was about the Olympic Games of 1936 and was directed by uh, the legendary filmmaker Leni Riefenstahl. So Leni Riefenstahl, because she was Hitler's favorite filmmaker and uh, was the face of the Nazi regime, she was blacklisted for decades. And uh, uh, even though the politics of her films are controversial to say the least, she was indeed somebody who advanced the film language immensely. And James Carr thought that uh, no matter what her politics are, it is important to save the films. And while many archives were turning archives were turning away from her, he actually saved the negative of this legendary film. And so the negative of Olympia is currently at the George Eastman Museum. The film has been since then considered a classic, preserved multiple times. Leni Riefenstahl, who died at 101, I actually even saw her when she was 99 once, uh, introduced the film multiple locations, but again, uh, thanks to James Card, the film exists and the film is here. Uh, the image on the right is from, we shouldn't be talking just about the huge commercial films, even Olympia was a big commercial success, at least in Germany, but um, the avant-garde and the experimental cinema. So the image on the right is from a film by um, Luis Buñuel, a great uh, Spanish, Mexican, French uh, filmmaker one of the uh, geniuses of uh, um, surrealist, if you wish, uh, uh, cinema. And uh, this film, which was made in partial collaboration with Salvador Dali in 1930, is uh, maybe the first sound avant-garde film. It was made in France. And there were two original prints that were known to exist. So James Card was a friend of Henri Langlois, the head of the French Cinematheque and also one of the founders of FIA, one of the first film, make, film archivists in the world. And while Langlois was touring the United States with a, a collection of films, as the legend goes, he was short of cash. So he sold this original print, which very likely belonged to Louis Brunel himself. He sold the print to his friend James Card. And now we have one of the two original prints, the only two original prints of this great masterpiece of, of surreal, surrealist cinema, uh, avant-garde cinema. And what is very important, all of those single titles which were acquired by James Card and our first archivists, they planted seeds which later, you know, grew into beautiful trees because now we have one of the most important collections of avant-garde and experimental cinema, especially of American experimental and avant-garde cinema of the uh, 1920s, 30s and 40s. Um, maybe along with MoMA, it is the most significant collection of that cinema. So uh, this is another side. So we are an international collection, not a collection of just American films, which leads to another international um, slide. Uh, the, the two things that were brought from uh, Russia, the Soviet Union, and both are quite unique. On the right uh, is an image from uh, one of the first Soviet color animation films called The Duckling. And 
there are no color prints known to exist from this film, only uh, a black and white negative. And the negatives in those days, just like with technical in the United States, were black and white color separations, two or three negative depending on your negatives, depending on your system. So in order to do a proper reconstruction, to see the beauty of the colors, and they're quite stunning, as you see here, one needs to have a print or at least a frame. So the, there are no prints, but the only collection of frames for those early Soviet color animation films are here at the George Eastman Museum. And the image on the left uh, is from a film that I'm sure many of uh, film historians have never heard of, The Great Fergana Canal, which was being filmed in Uzbekistan by Sergei Eisenstein. This is Eisenstein's unfinished work, something he was doing right after Alexander Nevsky. And there are only three, no, four, sorry, four little uh, strips of film known to exist, and all of them are here at the George Eastman Museum, nothing even in Russia. So, Great masterpieces, uh, obscure films, American films, foreign films. It's really a huge, huge collection. Deb, do you want to add, add anything to this? No, I saw, I don't know if it's okay to answer the question in the Q&A that's already there. Margaret. Absolutely, go ahead. Okay. Uh, our person was asking how much of our collection, percentage of world cinema versus American cinema is in the archive. I'm not sure. Uh, this person is referring to just the nitrate bulbs or just in terms of the overall collection of the museum or for overall moving image department. But I would say for the nitrate, it's a good 10% of our nitrate holdings are uh, foreign. Um, and the reason is that uh, we, have, we have a lot of French cinema in there, but also uh, we have a lot of German cinema, we have a lot of Italian cinema, and we actually in the 1980s repatriated a lot back to the to the home countries as part of our work with FIOF. So we don't, people always ask if we have like a lot of Canadian nitrate and the truth is we don't because we repatriated a lot of all of it back to Canada. So in many cases, we've worked a lot with the, um, the National Archives in those countries and would either do exchanges or even if we just loaned the nitrate so they could do preser make preservation elements, if they couldn't store the nitrate, we would of course store it again. But with, with the International Federation of Film Archives, we've done a lot of that with our, with our nitrate holdings. Um, I'll let Peter take it from here on anything else. Yeah, I would just say that we keep doing that. And uh, also we are getting, we're, we're currently working on uh, joint restoration projects of uh, several very obscure Italian films. Some were actually made in Italy and some were made in the United States for the Italian diaspora. There was a whole group of films in the early 30s, especially. So we're working with the Centro Sperimentale di Cinematografia in, uh, in Rome on this joint restoration project just as we are about to start another project with the Austrian film archive on a Austrian southern film from 1927, which is considered lost. So we're always doing that. And of course, equally we're being uh, either sent prints of American films from foreign archives, or we're doing a joint restoration with them. And we'll talk a little more about that later. Yeah. So we're very active in this international field of film restoration. Oh yeah. Construction. <laughs> oh yeah. There's quite a few. I would love to talk to Peter about more of doing preservation on it's, it's just finding the funding because a lot if they're if, where their starting country is and what, what we can do here but Peter knows I've got my my short list of films that I really really want to do that are from other countries but are we have the only unique copy and, and working on things like that so anyway moving on <laughs> uh and yeah one more thing so um here are two great pieces of film with sort of a completely different accent on them. So the one on the right, Queen Kelly, is one of the works of, uh, of um, Eric von Stroheim, one of the greatest filmmakers of all times. He uh, made less than a dozen films. Uh, and you know, it's a little bit like a painting by, by, by Vermeer. There are some museums are lucky to have one or two of his best uh, uh, sort of reference prints. And we have the best elements on his um, last silent film, Queen Kelly, with Gloria Swanson, he, she's on the right. So uh, as almost everything that Eric von Stroheim did, uh, the project went astray and not whatever the word, whatever word you want to use. It was never completed, it was released, only part of it was released, uh, edited by another filmmaker. And much, much later, um, more elements were found and there was a reconstruction project in the 80s and now we're engaged in another one. But what we have at the Eastman Museum is the best print of this film, 
a beautiful and stunning nitrate print, which belonged personally to Gloria Swanson, who was a friend of James Carr. And this was this print is the main source of all the preservation restoration projects. And we're currently working on another one. Uh, the one on the left is an image of Adele Astaire. Adele Astaire was Fred Astaire's sister. Uh, they were uh, um, a duo in the 1920s and early 30s, and arguably she was more famous than he was at the beginning of their career as a singer. Um, she never made any movies. There is very little footage of her, and mostly it's in newsreels. We don't really uh, see her act, and she, I think, pronounces a couple of words in one of them. What we have here, we have a huge collection of... Um, Selznick screen tests for films like Almost the Wind, Rebecca, and many other great masterpieces of American cinema. But also there are there are some remarkable curiosities, let's put it this way, including Adela Stair's only screen test. She was considering going to the movies in the mid-30s after her marriage turned out to be an unhappy one. And this one screen test, she does a bit of acting and she's quite charming. And she sings uh, George Gershwin's hit, It's Wonderful. And this is a song that was written for her. It was her signature song. So to see her and to hear her perform the song is quite a treat. So that's yet another thing we uh, conserved here and are currently preserving, actually. But discovered not so long ago and identified not so long ago. Right? Um, OK, let's talk about difficult things. Let's talk about some bad news. So it hasn't always been easy to do. And uh, what those Henry Strait a strong vaults that were built in 1952. Uh, we did run out of space in um, those vaults and materials were stored in a barn next to the vaults. And on May 29th, 1978, it had been unusually warm in Rochester that weekend for quite some time. And some of the material did uh, catch fire from the heat and storage conditions. So we did have a nitrate fire on the property um, on May 29th, 1978. No, neither Peter and I were there at that time. I was, I think, three, not even three years old at that time, so don't blame me. But um, you can actually see in the picture on the right, you'll see there's a bit of a barn. That barn does still exist on the property of the museum near the strong vaults, but everything, the building structures in between um, were completely destroyed. And the trees behind the strong vaults from that earlier picture were also uh, destroyed. We lost about 300 elements um, of motion picture uh, material related in this fire. Um, unfortunately, we lost quite a bit of our animation collection. We lost a lot of our newsreels. And this is gonna break people's hearts, but we did lose the original camera negative for Singing in the Rain in this fire. So the only part that still exists is the uh, Broadway melody scene with Sid Charisse and Fred Astaire dancing and she's in that beautiful green dress and he's dancing around her. That had actually been loaned out to MGM at the time to make that's entertainment too. So that is the only part that still exists. And the ironic part about all of it is that that film was made on safety film stock on acetate and had been stored in the nitrate vaults with all the other Technicolor negatives at the time, not realizing that it actually could have been stored in a different location. So you can see here that we did lose some elements here. Thankfully, films like uh, like uh, Singing in the Rain, you know, there was full preservation on it. So we didn't lose anything that is now lost forever to, to people and to, to the future of hit film history and films and cinema. But we did lose some, some beautiful elements in this fire. And it made uh, the museum kind of realize, okay, we need to do... We need to do something about this. So what happened was after after all the flames were, were taken out and the insurance companies and everybody got involved was that um, we ended up going to our friends at the Library of Congress and asking if we can store some of our overflow nitrate with them and go to the next slide. And you can see that this was the right, this was at the Library of Congress at Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. These vaults were built, there was over hundred vaults on site. Um, and these were built on the Air Force Base to hold uh, the nitrate collections that were um, made during World War II and also for films that had been confiscated during the war as part of the Office for Alien Properties. So there was a lot of classified films that were stored here, a lot of newsreel footage, a lot of aerial footage. 
but they also had plenty of room for um, storing our, our films as well. And they were more than happy to take a lot of the Technicolor negatives for many years so that um, we knew that they were stored in a safe and secure location while the George Eastman Museum um, reconsidered how they wanted to store nitrate film, where did they want to store the nitrate film, and what was going to be the future with that particular collection. Do you want to add anything, Peter? No, no, I think I think it's all. Let's go to the next one. Let's talk about okay. the good things. Oh. Okay, let's go to the good things. So if we go to the next slide here, so this is where we are today. So in 1995, the George Eastman Museum purchased approximately four acres of land outside of the city of Rochester in a suburb and bought this building you see in the left-hand photo and converted it into holding nitrate storage. This is the Louis B. Mayer Conservation Center. And um, the picture on the right, you can see that we do have, I try to take an artsy photo of this one, it's kind of looking floor to ceiling, but we have um, a lot of film cans that we can store here in the, in the collection here. So we were able to bring back all of our material from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, as well as other materials we were storing in other locations on the East Coast, all into one building. And if you want to go to the next slide, you can see that um, we do have 12 vaults on site. Um, just to give you the numbers for those of you who like numbers, we have two each vault holds 2,184 film cans. We only store films on in 1,000 foot containers and only two cans per shelf for storage reasons. We meet everything with the National Fire Protection Association 40 rules that were designed in 1995. And when we expanded in 1999, uh, we do meet those regulations as well. Currently, this vault, the vaults can hold almost 26,000 reels of film, um, but we are 96% full. Because even though they haven't made nitrates since basically 1951, we still get donations quite often of nitrate film. Some pretty sp spectacular things too. So Peter will talk a little bit more about that part in a minute. But what we also do to help work on all of these films, if we go to the next slide, you'll see that we have a workroom available. So we do have some inspection benches available. We do have some tools available. The white pipes you see from the ceiling help do more airflow because as nitrate decomposes, it does let off an odor. Uh, we don't have any flatbed viewers or projection equipment because approximately 80% uh, of our motion picture collection is negatives, majority of which are original negatives. So not a lot of films that you can project per se from the 26,000. So we don't really have a lot of machines there that can handle that. Another reason is because a lot of our films are very shrunken. They've been stored in poor conditions over the years, whether in somebody's basement or attic or in a closet, or um, they're just age has gotten to them and they just need a little more TLC. But if we go to the next slide, we'll start talking a little bit about how we've improved everything. So one of the things that we have done with the help of the funders mentioned at the beginning of this presentation is to come up with some new vault improvements to help improve the way we store it and to make everything more energy efficient, which is definitely a key of what we're looking to do. Uh, one of the things we did install, install this year was um, two, actually two new chillers. That's the two white boxes you see here. And these are made by Train. They're 15 ton um, soft start chillers. There is a redundancy system on here so that they can both handle whether it's having extreme weather outside, whether it be too hot or too cold. And these new chillers we like for, uh, especially for two reasons. Number one, they will reduce our energy costs. We're hoping up to 15% just with these particular units. But I really like these because if you can see in that photo, we have a lot of trees in the background. And for those of you who know what a cottonwood tree is, they release a lot of fibers every spring. And they would go into our old chiller and, and clog it up and um, would often shut down our old chiller system and cause havoc. With these new systems, we should have a lot less of those kinds of disruptions into our vault cooling systems from this point on, which is going to make me a very happy person. Um, on the right, you can see that we also replaced a lot of the pipes and the insulation on these, as well as the water pumps on the floor. And this way we have a good cooling system going through. I don't have a picture, but we replaced the coolant tank as well and the insulation on that so that uh, we can, um, again, have an efficient system to get the proper cooling system through the vaults as we are doing 12 vaults constantly with a fresh air exchange every 20 to 30 minutes keeping them cool and dry is extremely hard to do when you have such weather changes as we have in Rochester, New York. But the new system that we have set up and that we're gonna to continue to do over the next several years to keep making these improvements with insulating, with um, hopefully a new roof, 
fingers crossed, Peter, um, with other uh, improvements that we're going to be doing, you're going to see a lot more um, stability and you're going to see a lot more efficiency with how we are storing these materials in our current environment. Um, and actually, uh, we are going to finally expand our walls because we're almost full. So if you see, this is you know a blueprint, but if you see those uh, 12 long sort of boxes on the top, these are our 12 uh, nitrate walls, and each of them can store a little more than 2,000 reels. Um, and uh, the problem is that, that there, are not, there is not too much nitrate space in the country, not just at the Eastman Museum. All of the walls are getting more and more full, so now... Um, thanks to uh, the funding from the Packard Humanities Institute by PHI, we will be building three more uh, nitrate walls. These are the, this is the area which is uh, highlighted light blue. So that's more than 6,000 reels in addition to the 2,000 we can store right now. Uh, so we are still welcoming new nitrate donations, uh, you know, in, in the US or worldwide. So if you have any nitrate films, please contact us. We definitely have not just the means to store them in good conditions, but the place to store them too, which was not, not always the case. Mm -hmm. Let's move on, because we're a little bit running out of time. Let's move to the next one. Um, Deb, want to say something about this? So if you're asking yourself, well, why are we going through all this trouble for um, preserving these films? They always look beautiful. Well, they don't always look beautiful. Sometimes um, when we receive ob objects, they do come in and they, they need a lot of care. So the image on the left, you can see where the image, it looks like it's kind of running off the emulsion. We call this stage one decomposition, where you can see the words are kind of slipping and falling down on this Lubin film. Um, this is uh, when films become sticky, they become smelly, they start to decay, they become very brittle. And with the image on the right, you can see that there is, uh, this is called stage four decomposition. We also call it hockey puck stage, where the film has been stored on a metal reel in a high temperature and humidity conditions. And the metal reel you can see has rusted over and the film has actually crusted over and made into solid chunks. At this point, there's hardly anything we can do with the material but try to salvage a few frames here and there if we can. But this is what we're trying to avoid and why we go through all this trouble to conserve and preserve these films is because we want to avoid opening a can and finding this inside. Our goal is a cool and dry environment, um, conservation versus preservation in terms of what do we do to keep the materials alive so that we can move forward to doing the full preservation process. And I'll let Peter elaborate, elaborate a little bit more on the differences there. Yeah. Um, so conservation basically means, uh, and by the way, there are different definitions in photography and film. We're just talking about moving image here. So conservation means storing the films in the best condition and making sh the necessary repairs to make sure that the actual physical object is still there 10, 20, and hopefully several hundred years from now, just like with a painting, so that you would be able to use it for preservation purposes or even sometimes to a screen because we do have projectable nitrate prints. Whereas preservation, we're making new copies that could be actively screened throughout the world. Uh, we think that films should be preserved in their original format, which for nitrate films means going back, well, not to nitrate film, but to films, to 35 millimeter. But of course, we live in a contemporary world. We're being realistic. So there's always a digital copy made as well. And uh, film preservation is one of our main activities and one of our strengths. And it's uh, all of the films mentioned here before, uh, you know, The Cheat and uh, Phantom of the Opera and Body and Soul, they all have been preserved. We have the nitrate elements still. They are still conserved well, but we also have new copies. We have new preservation negatives and new prints and new DCPs. These are just some of, the, some of our very latest preservation projects. One is The Unknown, another um, Lon Chaney film, uh, a great masterpiece of horror cinema starring Lon Chaney and uh, John Crawford, one of the biggest first, first big parts in silent cinema, and directed by Todd Browning. The film was known to be incomplete, and we preserved whatever was incomplete 50 years ago uh, from a French print that we still have. We conserved the nitrate print, but uh, recently another nitrate print was discovered in the Czech Republic. It was also incomplete, but they matched perfectly with the French version as a jigsaw puzzle, and now the film has been reconstructed 
So we compared it shot by shot and put it back together. And it is, uh, well, I think triumphantly, triumphantly would be the right word. It is being screened all over the world right now uh, in film festivals and it's going to be released on uh, home video and so forth. Another thing, just one little curiosity, and I really, you know, we can talk for hours about preservation projects. The Gold Rush, a canonical film by Charlie Chaplin, one of the greatest films of all times. Film is known to be black and white. Chaplin did not like tinting in cinema. We received recently a donation of an incomplete print, just one reel of The Gold Rush, with this light blue tinting. And we did some research. It is still work in progress. But apparently, Chaplin did try tinting in this film. And he tinted the whole thing, or almost the whole thing, we still need to discover that, light blue, which is the effect you can get uh, in you know, broad daylight when everything is covered by snow. And you forget about the blue, but there is something different about the color. This was how sophisticated Chaplin was in color. So we preserved this one fragment, and now we are considering a larger reconstruction of the gold rush with Chaplin's original color. Um, and well, last just a couple of minutes about projecting nitrate film deb since you uh you know you know what is projectable and you have been in projections yourself why don't you start and then i'll pick up so yeah so projecting nitrate film is something we've always been doing at the george eastman museum when we built uh the dryden theater it was actually designed to be nitrate ready so there's a lot of regulations for for projecting nitrate film um, in terms of how the projectors are laid out, how in terms of the projection booth is laid out, there has to be two exits. Um, there must be covers over all of the portholes that can come down if there's a fire. The projectors must have a cooling system. They must have fire rollers and magazines on them. So one of the objects that we do at the George Smith Museum when we go through our nitrate collections or with any, any materials that are coming across our way is we look to see if it's projectable. We want to know if it's still accessible in its in its original form that as we have received it to be able to be shown to a public audience. And so quite often what we started to do many years ago was started to make a list of, well, this could still be projectable. I bet we could still show this in the Dragon. And every once in a while, we would pull one of them out and show them to a public screening. Um, this is our century projectors. These are the original ones that were installed in the Dryden Theater back um, in the 1950s and are still in existing in use today. So we still have them, we still have them going. That we, these things are little workhorses. They, they'll just keep going and going and going. So starting in about 2015, we decided to have more of a festival don't, uh, connected directly just to nitrate motion picture film. And starting off on the ground, the first year was kind of a, a testing ground to see if people would truly be interested in coming all the way to Rochester in, um, in the spring to see some nitrate films. And it's sort of been taking off from there. Uh, so I'll let Peter take it, take it from here. Yeah, and projectability depends on many different things. It's the shrinkage of the prints are too shrunk and they cannot be projected. But it's also how good are the splices? They're always splices because something is missing. Do they hold well or do they fall apart? How good are the perforations? Are they cracked? And will they be cracked more when you project them? And many, many other things. Um, so here is a collage of things we showed over the years. It's very, these are the actual prints we've screened at the United Picture Show. And you see there are some great films, well-known ones such as Pinocchio, such as Hitchcock Throbe, or the great French film, uh, Jules Selev with Jean Gabin on top. Our lesser known uh, works as, a, I think, a wonderful film by Douglas Sir called Schlussaccord. You see this uh, lady in shadows on the right. Avant-garde films such as Len Lies. Um, I think this one is from, uh, what year? Not Colorism. It'll go back to me. Um, and um, no, Trey tra Tattoo. Or even silent films, like the image on the top, on the uh, bottom left is from a silent film called Ramona in original tinted nitrate print. It is remarkable how many prints are still projectable, and not only from our collection. We screen prints from all over the world. Um, the oldest print we've screened so far from 1913, a short film, actually came from MoMA. Uh, we work with all of the American uh, archives and many world ones. Uh, the beautiful print of Pinocchio, and this is actually an image from this nightly print, not from the internet. Uh, the colors are authentic, and I think much better than in the new restorations, don't tell anyone. Uh, so this print is from Switzerland, and we showed such films as Casablanca and Leave Her to Heaven and uh, much, much more. We do not announce the titles in advance, 
Uh, the titles are announced on the very first day of the festival, with one exception. We talk about we announced the very first screening on a Thursday, and this year on June first is going to be Paul and Pressburger's uh, one of the most stunning color films ever made, Black Narcissus, a British film from 1947, with Deborah Carr. And uh, then the titles are announced, except for the very last one, which is a blind date with nitrate which of course I wouldn't make any hints of, but I want to say one thing, this image, these eyes are actually from a print we're going to show this year and good luck trying to guess what it is. <laughs> um, so uh, if you want to come, it's quite an experience. We are most, most welcome because I think it's, you know, if people go to Paris to see the Mona Lisa, well, I think they should try to see if it is still possible, if it's still projectable, see the original, films of the 19, well, teens very rarely, but 20s, 30s, 40s, early 50s, the way they were made to be seen in their original Nightwood prints. So you're most welcome to visit us uh, at the Night of Picture Show. Uh, thank you. And uh, perhaps we have any questions. Do we? Uh, so I would say we have time for one or two questions. I know we answered one earlier, um, but again, if you do have one, just throw it in the Q&A. Um, and thank you again, Peter and Deb, for wonderful conversation about nitrate. Um, this will be my first festival, so I'm very excited to see how that's going to go. Um, so we have one question for you here. Uh, so what safety measures do you take while projecting nitrate uh, to put my mind at ease? So what we do is we actually have uh, three projectionists in the booth. So we do a reel-to-reel -reel exchange, so we don't have everything on a platter projector, which you'd see in modern systems. We're always in the projection booth, and one person is manning each, each projector while it is running, while the other person is threading the next one. So we never leave the projector alone. We also do several checks before the preservation, before the, um, the presentation. So we, when we get the film, we do a thorough inspection. We then run it through the projectors with the lamp off to make sure everything is okay. Check the print again, make sure nothing was damaged. And then we'll run it again with the lamp and the sound on and Peter sits in and um, other staff can sit in on that to check the focus, to check to make sure it's complete, to make sure that we're not having any other inner damage happening with it. And then we check, inspect the film again and look for more damage. And this is all what we do before even programming. We do have several specialized uh, projectionists that do work in our booth, projection booth, and they go through a lot of training throughout the year for this. We also do have to meet standards by the fire marshal. We have, um, you know, obviously the fire extinguishers around. We do have nitrate protection um, storage cases in the projection booth. Um, we are required by law to have, you know, two open exits on both sides. And we do tell people during the screenings that um, make sure you know where your nearest exit is in case there's a problem. I never have never had a nitrate fire, knock on wood, at the museum. I know one time I projected a nitrate print and a splice broke on me, but everything was fine because we have a cooling system, we do have fire rollers, and we are very, very careful with every single frame of our films to make sure that we don't have an accident. So I can tell you that I've been projecting, I've been working with nitrate for a long time. I've been projecting it for many, many years. And it's probably most nerve wracking for the projectionist than it is for, for anybody else because, but once they get that practice in and they, they really get to know those prints before the festival, they even have a good time and they really enjoy it. Yeah, I would add one thing that what makes it nervous is not because we're afraid of a fire. We're doing a lot of, no. you know, pre inspection work. It's because we're afraid that we might damage a print. Yeah. So this this is a much this is a much more nervous thing in this respect. Our prints are somebody else's prints. But the good thing, the good news is that uh even though we have the only nitrate film festival dedicated entirely to nitrate film, we are not the only venue in the world that screens nitrate. There is nothing else on the East Coast, but there are three venues on the West Coast that show nitrate occasionally, not as frequently as we do. And uh, we actually set a good example because some of the venues abroad are now resuming nitrate screenings. The British Film Institute had just uh, launched nitrate screenings again after almost 15 years of no nitrate. I know that Japan is considering doing it again. So we're very lucky and we're very proud that we could set a good example. Uh, a format that was considered obsolete, almost obsolete, 10 years ago is now considered yeah. still, you know, feasible for, for projection if you treat it well. So if you have a nitrate print at home uh -huh. and a projector, please, please do not project because it's highly unlikely that you have 
the proper safety measures, even if it is not too shrunken. Yeah, I think my big fear always when I was projecting nitrate wasn't really a fire or anything. It was putting the reels out of order or something. Like, last thing I want to do was reveal the end of a murder mystery before they even got the plot. That was always my concern. One of the things we also check is the, the continuity of a script, because sometimes people would rearrange orders of films or cut things out. So um, that was always my big concern, actually, with projecting nitrate, Peter. And I think this will probably be our last question today, but we have someone asking about um, digitization. Not sure if they mean the process or your thoughts concerning it, um, but it says, can you speak briefly about digitization? Well, let me try. So uh, we have a digital lab, which is called Film Preservation Services, FPS, which is located at Coded Park. Uh, where we do digital restoration work. So we do digitize films. Our principle, as we mentioned earlier, is uh, that we stick to the original format. First, we preserve something on film. If it was first released on 35, we go back to 35. If it was released on 16, we go back on to 16. And if the print is in ideal condition, we've usually preferred to do it photochemically and then scan the result. But we want the films to be accessible. So if something has been preserved, uh, we scan those uh, prints or the preservation negatives and we make DCPs, which are being shown in all the world. We put films uh, online. So we're doing it doing it quite actively. And uh, um, yep, so it's, a, it's, it's now a part of the agenda, an essential part of the agenda. But we do believe that uh, um, not only is it more authentic to have a print, it's an authentic experience and you keep the grain and so forth because when you digitize you can do a lot of harm you can over digitize you can over restore and it happens all over the world even in some great archives uh but also it is easier to store film we know how to do it we know we have the best conditions there is experience and there are many challenges in digital storage so uh i don't know if that was a part of the question but are we going to go entirely to, to, to digital preservation and uh digital storage as long as we can, we would try to avoid that. Mm -hmm. And I think it is possible because this is the mentality of the world film archival community as of today. Yeah, and I think what's also really important is that when we do digitize, say, a tinted film, we do take the tinted nitrate and do a comparison to the digitization to make sure we're getting as close of an accurate representation as possible. So we don't just digitize it and, and over clean anything and make it look like it's not even digital or even grain or anything anymore, as Peter was describing. We also take that original element and try to match those colors, like you saw of the Gold Rush, and make it look as authentic as possible. Even though it is a, a different format, we still want to keep that nitrate, um, what that nitrate represents to still be reflected in that digitization digital object. Does that make sense, Peter? Yep, and we, 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 we got a response to this long live analog, indeed. Yeah, oh yeah, you know me, yeah. <laughs> All right, well, it is two o'clock over here in Rochester, so we ended perfectly on time. Uh, thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Peter and Deb. Um, and thank you for new and returning museum members and guests. As I said, this will be online in about a week. Um, and if you're interested in future talks in person or online exhibits or membership information, again, our website is eastman.org. And I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their Saturday. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.